Praise God. Yeah, praise God. Some people bring teddy bears, I bring a ball. This is the night the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And it's a good night to what? To die to ourself. The ultimate goal. Amen? <laughs> Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. I gotta lift your hands. I haven't get a drink. Hallelujah, Father. We thank you for the anointing. We thank you. Glory. In Luke four and verse sixteen. Would you read it with me? So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And as he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to pray, claim liberty to the captives, the recovery of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your what? In your what? It's fulfilled in your hearing. I want to share something with you that's very important. Because Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Amen? And the first thing he goes into the synagogue after, and again, remember, he just came out from being tempted 40 days, just kicked butt on the devil, and he was stronger in the spirit now. Does everybody hear that? He was what? Stronger in the spirit. See, you don't get stronger in the spirit without battles. And he comes out and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. And to make it simple and short, he says, he's anointed me to give you the gospel, to tell the truth, to reveal to you the kingdom, to heal you and to free you from the bondages of the devil, and to bring sight because you've been blind, because you were born blind in this realm, and to bring restoration. And I want to go back because he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, He is the anointed one bringing the anointing. So everybody got it. And He said something very powerful because it said, today the Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, are you willing to catch the anointing? See, the anointing is not taught. It is caught. The anointing is what? It's not taught, it's caught. The anointing teaches you. You can't teach the anointing. And it is caught. Go to Acts chapter 10. One of the reasons Jesus came into the natural realm, I said one of the reasons, there are many, not only to produce manufacturer's own blood that would wipe away sins, but to leave his spirit for us to be anointed. Why? Because the ruler of this world is Satan. And we'll go into that another time. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, would you read it with me? And the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the anointing was to 
overcome the powers of darkness. The anointing was to bring us into another realm. The anointing is the eternal presence, power, and truth. Now, the anointing is the eternal presence. In other words, in the presence of God, it expresses his character. The eternal presence, power. In the power of God, it gives you dominion and authority by the anointing. And in truth, it means you are carrying the message of God. Either for that moment or what was or what is to come. Because it's multidimensional. Remember, the anointing is to defeat the devil's presence, his character, the devil's power as he rules, as ruler in this realm, and to defeat what he calls his truths, which are actually lies of deception. That's his anointing. Has everybody got it? See, the devil has been anointed also. He was known as the anointed cherub. So he does carry an anointing, doesn't he? But he uses the anointing against God's people. So again, the anointing is the eternal presence, power, and truth. And so the, the anointed cherub who was Lucifer carries an anointing. Is everybody okay? And he carries a presence, which is his character. He carries his power, which we call witchcraft. Are you listening? And he carries what he calls his truth, which actually lies in deception. So the only way to overcome those things is to walk in the anointing. It is essential we walk in the anointing. Because without the anointing, you'll be deceived in one of those areas. You'll be misled by his character. You'll be med, uh, taken bondage by his power. And you'll be deceived. Because Satan's greatest weapon is deception and his power is fear. Is everybody with me? Go to Acts chapter 9. Hallelujah. I guess we didn't have to go too far. <laughs> In verse 17. Now Saul, who was out killing all those of the faith who had been walking in the Spirit with God, proclaimed Christ as their Lord and Savior. Paul was a Pharisee. I'm giving you a little scenario, and we're going to go from 17, okay? Come on, catch it now. And Paul got slapped off of his horse. God stopped him. He was blinded. And he was taken to a house. And uh, the Lord visited one of his servants, Ananias, and told him to go over there to see Paul, or who, was, who was actually Saul. And in verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your what? Sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Ananias was obviously baptized in the Holy Ghost and was carrying the anointing. Because you can't give what you don't have. And the Lord spoke to Ananias and Ananias went in there and he said, listen, men, I know you can't see right now. And you know that the Lord Jesus has appeared to you and, and obviously you've accepted him as your savior and Lord. Now you need to be empowered. So he laid his hands on him and he said, get filled with the Holy Ghost. In verse 18, it says, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ, the Christ, meaning the anointed one and his anointing, in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and and how has he come here 
for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. In other words, they were thinking, oh my God, is he, is he lying? Is he deceiving? Has he come to attack us again? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ, is the anointed one. Why? Because he had caught the anointing. He what? He caught the anointing. And when he caught the anointing, he changed. Because in the anointing is the eternal presence, power, and truth, or the message. So after Paul caught the anointing, he went out to decree and carry the message from God. Is everybody okay? The anointing. I want you to look at the anointing as a sphere ball that God sends. Are you, are you with me? And in the anointing, there is a message of God in here. And when the anointing hits you, the ball breaks. And you get saturated, and the message is left in your spirit. Are you listening? So catch the anointing. <laughs> Do you ever see a water balloon? Do you know when it hits somebody? That's the anointing. It's a big water balloon about that size. Roll that back to me. Can you man get, imagine getting hit with a water balloon this size? <laughs> Catch the anointing. And when the anointing comes, you catch it. Soto kaya rojosa. And when the anointing comes and bursts, he leaves a message. Remember, the anointing is the eternal presence, the power, and the truth. And many people allow the anointing to bounce off of them and they don't catch it. Some of them out there, right? <laughs> so the anointing is what? It's caught. It isn't what? Taught. See, Paul caught the anointing. They carried the message from God. And brought revelation of the unseen. And when he caught the anointing and brought revelation of the unseen, you know what he did? He carried a message, a mystery of the unseen to the world. See, there's something that happens when you catch the anointing. You desire to teach the message. When the message comes to you, you desire to teach it. You desire to decree it. That's why in our discipleship program, we share with everyone, look to teach what you get because it causes you to catch. If everything you're getting, you're thinking about how can I teach this or how can I decree this, how can I teach this and how can I give this message? What it does is causes you to catch the anointing. Go to John 6. Catching the anointing. In verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Also surely I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. 
These things he taught in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is hard saying. Uh, who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Why? Because they are the message in the anointing. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. So he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Why did they go away? Because they did not catch the anointing. But Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the what? Words of eternal life. See, he caught the anointing. Do you get this? He caught it. And because he caught it, it was able to change him. There's so many individuals and even so-called believers now that are not catching the anointing. They're caught. The only thing they're catching is religiosity. And it isn't changing them. It isn't bringing them a thirst and hunger. Because let me tell you, when you catch the anointing, you get thirsty and hungry for God's presence. You want more, more, and more. And let me tell you something. You ain't turning around and going away. You're not going back to the world. There is no desire to go back. None. Some caught the anointing and some it bounced off. The ones it bounced off no longer followed. That's why people go another direction. Go to 1 John chapter 2. I want you to understand that the anointing is not caught once. You continually catch it. It's not a one-time event. It's a lifetime event. You're always looking to catch the anointing. No matter what. Wherever you are, you're looking to catch the anointing. But if the anointing is not being delivered, there ain't nothing to catch. Hallelujah. And John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, would you read it with me? Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming, even now men the Antichrist have come, by which we know that it's the last hour. So he's saying, many are going to come against the anointing. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Why? Because they stopped catching the anointing. See, pride and complacency and compromise and laziness will always put you in a place to reject the anointing. And you don't even know it. You won't even know it. It comes later. Verse 20. But you what? You have a what? An anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Go to verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now the anointing teaches us. Right now the anointing is teaching you, not this person. This person couldn't teach you anything. But the anointing can teach you. The anointing brings revelation. The anointing comes forth with the sword of the Spirit. 
The anointing in us, now I want you to get this, because the anointing in us is supplied by the anointed one. Now your spirit is anointed by his presence desiring to express his character to guide you, to teach you. But the anointing that we are to catch what we call falling on us or comes to us carries power and a message. Once it is caught, it can be taught. The message not the anointing. Once the anointing is caught, there's a message in the anointing. Now it can be taught. The message can be taught. Because the Bible says the anointing teaches us. Catching the anointing takes three principles. Give me some of those teachings. Those teachings. Give me a handful of teachings. Catching the anointing takes three principles. Is everybody ready? Thank you. Just put them up here. The right place. The right time. And the right heart. The right place. The right time. And the right heart. Will allow you to catch the anointing. What you see are teachings, packages. There are teachings. These are teachings that came from catching the anointing and they were taught. Why? Because in the anointing is the message. Has everybody got it? So you're seeing recorded teachings that have been caught by the anointing and recorded now. Does everybody get it? So we can't take these for granted, can we? It's not just some kind of teaching that somebody just went out and studied. I don't study. I pray in the Holy Ghost. And as I pray in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit brings things to me. And as He brings things to me and I catch the anointing, they're interpreted, they're taught, and they're recorded. And they set... God's people free because the anointing will set you free. Because it is truth, isn't it? Amen? Does everybody get it? Hallelujah. Go to Ezekiel 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. Catching the anointing. Takes three things. What is it? The right place, the right time, and the right heart. Starting at verse 1, Ezekiel 3. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. What was he doing? He was catching the anointing. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. How were those words brought to him? By the anointing. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech. In other words, they know. And hard language, but to the house of Israel. In other words, they know. They've heard God's voice. They knew about catching the anointing. But there's something that happened. Not too many people of unfamiliar speech and hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. <laughs> but to the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like adamant stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. 
Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive in your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. And go get to the captives, the children of your people, and speak to them. Tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. Ezekiel ate the scroll of the words of God because he caught the anointing that carried the message of truth. And then he was sent to speak it. And that's what God does with us. But the house of Israel would not receive it because their heart was hardened. They became religious. They became comfortable. They thought they knew it all, which is pride. And pride will always harden the heart. Always. See, there's got to be a desire to want to live for Christ. There's got to be a desire to surrender your life and give it up. When I was in jail today, one of the things I asked everyone, is anybody in here who uh, has received Jesus Christ as their Savior? And all of them, yeah, yeah. I said, good. Is there anyone who's not received Jesus as Savior? And everyone, nobody raised their hand. I said, nobody. I said, no, all of us have. We've all believers. Good. Then you don't have a life. And they all looked at me like, what? Well, the only reason why you're in jail is because you're fighting for your life. See, fighting for your life will put you in prison. It puts you in captivity of the enemy. Because you actually resist the anointing. Are you listening? You actually resist the anointing. You refuse to catch the anointing because you're too busy fighting for your life. And the anointing of the evil one comes and brings you into captivity. Then the individuals begin to listen to the lies. As believers, the word believe means to follow. We are to continuously surrender our life and stop fighting for it. And what's the worst thing that can happen? Praise God, you can go home. Who wants to stay here forever? Acts 28. That doesn't mean you're going to go out and challenge God, amen? You're not going to stand on a cliff, jump off, drink gas and stuff like that. Play with serpents. You know, you're not going to go out and do that stuff because you'll die. In Acts 28 and verse 24, Paul ministers at Rome. In verse 24, it says, Some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieve. In other words, some caught the anointing, and some the anointing bounced off. See, then the reason why the anointing bounced off, they couldn't catch the anointing because they were more concerned in their will than the will of God. Even though that they might know the will of God, they might say that they're a believer, they may say all of these things, but they can't catch the anointing. Because their agenda, their will, and their life is more important. And they might not even know it. Because Satan's greatest weapon is what? Deception. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our father saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. So that I should what? Heal them. So that I should what? See, catching an anointing will bring healing. That's when people get healed. What do they do? They catch the anointing. Go to John chapter 6. So you can't be caught up in your sickness. You must get caught up in catching the anointing. John chapter 6. Catching the anointing and be healed. In verse 16, 616. 
Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea to go into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because of great wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Now, something happened because they did what? They caught the anointing, didn't they? Well, Jesus was walking. He was walking on the water, wasn't he? And they received him in a boat. And the next thing they know, they're on the other side in the land. See, when you catch the anointing, it moves you places you never thought before. You can't imagine. You can't imagine. And, and, and it happened to Philip one time when he was ministering to a, a eunuch. And and he and, and he, he as he was ministering to eunuch, he got on the chariot with him. And he began to share with him about Jesus and so forth. And they stopped and and they got all the uh, off and, and and he said, "You want to be baptized?" He goes, "Yeah." So Philip takes him and baptizes him in the water, and, and the anointing came, and the eunuch got baptized in the Holy Spirit and took Philip away, and he ended up somewhere else. Because see, Philip caught the anointing to minister to the eunuch and then the anointing caught him and brought him to another place. Oh, glory. <laughs> Let's go a little further. Matthew 13. You know, there's something that Jesus said which was very powerful. He said... I come to you, not in my doctrine, but the one who sent me. In other words, because he was the anointed one and his anointing, he was the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty who was carrying a message. But he was the anointed one carrying the message. Everybody got it? Coming from the creator of all things. Whoever was, will, and ever will be. Matthew 13. Is anybody there? Let's start at verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And again, he says to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. In other words, to you has been granted to catch the anointing, but for them it's not been given yet. For whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, I'm talking about catching the anointing and the message that's in the anointing. So more will come to one that will catch more. But one who's now resisting the catching, caught up in self, even what he has will begin to be taken away and how watch therefore i speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand and in them the prophecy of isaiah is fulfilled saying hearing you will hear and not understand seeing you will see and not perceive for the hearts of this people have grown dull their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts in turn and that i should heal them but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the what? by the wayside this is an area where there is no desire to hear a person comes to please somebody else well you know my husband is telling me i need the lord my wife is telling me this well i'm coming here for them wrong you'll never get anything until you choose to do it 
for you and him. Verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. This is an individual who has no intention to apply the word. He hears it, receives it. Oh, great, but doesn't want to apply it. Verse 22. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, he's willing to exchange when he catches the anointing, the message for worldliness. In verse 23. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And this one is one who lives for the anointing. He has been positioned in a place, the right place, the right time, and the right heart. Because he has an open heart. And he is truly living for Christ now. So what he receives by the anointing, it stays because he wants to teach what he has just been taught or what he has just caught. Second Timothy chapter 4. Catching the anointing. The right place, the right time, and the right heart. Second Timothy chapter 4. That's why you see many people who start off then fall off. They catch the anointing. They get the message. But there really is, they're doing it for somebody else or there's no desire or intention to apply it in their life. They can speak big words or they're still fighting for their life and the cares of the world choke it because they're actually exchanging it for their way. And they fall off. And it's a shame because without the anointing, we can do nothing. We are nothing without the anointing. That's why Jesus was the first thing when he came out of the wilderness. What did he do? He went to the synagogue and he preached. What did he preach? The anointing. The first message was the anointing. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers. In other words, individuals that are now rejecting. The, why? Because they still, they're living for themselves now. Now they're going to try to heap up individuals that are going to agree with them. And they're not catching the anointing. They're being deceived by the anointing of the evil one. Of his presence. They're being deceived, aren't they? Of his bondage, of his fear, and of course of his deception and lies. I can't tell you how many people come out to me and told me, the Lord told me this. And I'm like, no, he didn't. And I won't say anything. Because they're not willing to hear anyways. They caught the wrong anointing. Because see, there is a fruit to the right anointing. The right anointing is faithful. The right anointing is peace and joy. The right anointing is consistency. The right anointing is the fear of the Lord with respect and honor and reverence. The right anointing speaks differently, treats differently. The right anointing doesn't accuse, it exposes. The right anointing is submissive. The Bible says submit to God and resist the devil. 
the right anointing. The right anointing doesn't compromise. It's not lazy. The right anointing sees it all the way through. The right anointing is a worshiper and loves the presence of God more than anything. Because your anointed spirit in you now wants to be supplied by the anointing from the anointed one. The right anointing brings death to self. The right anointing fights for the presence of God. The right anointing is submissive to authority. The right anointing will produce the fruits of the Spirit. The wrong anointing will produce the fruits of the flesh. And verse 4, And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. In other words, they rejected the anointed message and tried to find one that pleased them. Now listen, they find one that pleased what we call a mixed anointing. Oh, I'm not going to go into that, but we have teachings on it. It's the wrong anointing. Those are familiar spirits. See, familiar spirits bring another anointing. And it always promotes self. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. In verse 1, let's read this together, please. <laughs> See, so when you get up to a brother or sister and you can see how their response is, you can ask them what they caught that day. What'd you catch today, brother? What anointing did you catch? <laughs> In verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Verse 2, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks what? Mysteries. How did he speak mysteries? Because he caught the what? Anointing. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And now he's talking about the gifts of the tongue. These are the gifts of the Spirit. He said, I wish you all spoke with tongues. You know why they didn't? Because they rejected it. Because if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, that gift is there. But some rejected. They, wouldn't, they didn't accept the gift. They didn't accept the anointing. But even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So even interpretation of tongues is important. How are you going to interpret tongues? Well, when you pray in tongues... The anointing comes, amen? The message comes, the revelation comes, the mystery comes, and it's interpreted because when you catch it, you want to what? Teach it. That's why Paul wrote all of these messages that were interpreted tongues. They were mysteries that he spoke. Mysteries of God. How? Because he caught the anointing by praying in the Spirit and the message was brought to him and then he interpreted, put it on paper and wrote the letters to the churches. Nobody even knew or understood about the gifts of the Spirit. He did. Nobody understand about the spiritual warfare. He did. Has everybody got it? Nobody could explain it the way he explained it. Nobody talked about the fruits of the flesh or the law of the Spirit. He did. Why? Because he caught the anointing with the message of truth and was able to interpret it and send it out. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
speaks mysteries, anointed messages of revelation. First Corinthians chapter two. Is everybody okay? Go ahead, slap your neighbor and tell him this is your night. We've been watching too many uh, bad details and uh, <laughs> Christian comedians. First Corinthians chapter two, <laughs> and verse six. Would you read it with me? However, we speak wisdom among those who are what mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. For whose glory? Our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his what? His spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. In other words, God has revealed them to us through the anointing. Through the what? The anointing, the wisdom of God in a mystery. And how did that mystery come? By catching the anointing. Go to chapter 3 in verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, natural as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you are st still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is, there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like what? Mere men. So they couldn't catch the anointing. Because they were still what? Carnal. They couldn't receive the anointed message because they were not in the right place at the right time, and with the right heart. And what that does is keep you carnal. Keeps you caught up in the natural and not in the spirit. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Catching the anointing brings mysteries. The anointed messages of revelation. Making what is unseen to become seen. Revelation. Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Would you read it with me? Where there is no revelation, a people cast off restraints. In other words, they can no longer restrain the flesh. But happy is he who keeps the law. No revelation, no restraints to the flesh. The more like you catch the anointing, the more you will grow. The more you will mature. You will begin to discern the difference between feeling and the anointing. You'll begin to discern the difference between emotional and the anointing. You'll begin to discern the difference between truth and deception. Because the anointing grants you discernment. Oh, hallelujah. Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. In verse 17. So it's important that we catch the anointing because it brings a message of revelation. And why? Because when that comes, you get thirsty again. You stay hungry. You want God's presence more and more. You want to know more about Him. You love Him more than anything. More than your wife, your children, everything. More than your job, your finances, and your ability and talents. He is everything, and everything else is nothing. He is your source, and everything else is a resource. In the anointing. 
So when that revelation comes, you restrain flesh. But when it doesn't come, the restraints come off of the flesh. And people come and allow the flesh to take them. And the flesh is associated with the anointing of the evil one. Remember, he does have an anointing. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as what? The rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but you have not learned or been taught by the anointing. If you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, and true righteousness and holiness. That's called putting on the anointing. Catching the anointing. Maintaining the anointing. Go to Philippians 3. And then one more scripture. See, the anointing no matter what I'm hearing, no matter where I go, whatever, I'm always, I want to be prepared because I want to catch whatever God has. I can even get something out of a dead church. You know what I get? Get out of there. <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> Believe me, I was at a meeting one time when I heard the Holy Ghost, get out of here. I'm out. Look around this room. Tell me what you're going to get. Get out of there. Whew, I was gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Philippians 3. <laughs> well, the, I don't know if God would say that. Of course he would. Didn't he call those religious idiots hypocrites? Then he's telling them that you lead the blind. You're blind and you lead the blind. Then he tell them you bring people into bondage because of your own traditions. You can't hear what Jesus said to me. You can't catch the anointing because you're so caught up in your own stuff. He wept over them. He wept. Because they could not catch the anointing because they couldn't realize the day of his visitation. There he was. The anointed one and his anointed, the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty walked amongst his people. And many couldn't receive it. Rebuked him. Spoke evil of him. Their own creator, they couldn't recognize. They had the scriptures their whole life, but they were so caught up in their own twisted ways because of the anointing of the evil one deceived them even when they read the scriptures. But those who had the right heart were in the right place at the right time caught the anointing. There were many righteous men. Remember when the Spirit came upon the prophets and they would prophesy. Well, they would catch the anointing and they would speak the message. And they didn't even know what they were talking about, some of them. They prophesied things that would come for thousands of years. Some of them prophesied the things about what had happened, spoke things that had happened. They didn't get it. They didn't need to. They just needed to catch the anointing and decree it. And it's been written. Philippians 3, verse 7. Would you read it with me? Important, important, important. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for the anointing. 
Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of the anointed one, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain the anointing. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in the anointing. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means my, I may attain it to the resurrection from the dead. Wow. He counted everything loss to catch the anointing. Everything. Remember something when Jesus went up to the disciples and he said, follow me. And when they did and they began to follow him and they began to follow the anointing. And Jesus began to speak to them and as it began to catch the messages, things began to change them. And these men dropped everything and followed the anointing. The same thing when Elijah saw, found Elisha. And he threw his mantle on him. And he was a wealthy man. He came from a wealthy family. And he had a plow with 12 oxen. That was very wealthy then. And Elisha said to Elijah, Man, I need to go say goodbye to mom and dad. And he said, What have I done to you? Got it. So what did he do? He broke up the plow killed the ox, offered it up to the Lord, and took off and followed Elijah. And the end result was there was always resistance in following the anointing. But there was the promise to double portion. You know, I had a vision years ago. And I was in a meeting. And I don't know if you remember, but when Elijah died, Elijah was taken alive. Elijah died and they buried him. And there was war going on and stuff going on and they threw a dead body into his tomb. And when the dead body hit the bones of Elijah, the man became alive. Because Elijah's servant betrayed him and there was nowhere to pass the anointing down. And I had a vision from the Lord. And I saw him. And he stood there like this. And he said, Guy, I died for you to go get that anointing for you. See, he died to go get the anointing that was never able to be passed on so he could pass it on. He went to hell, destroyed the works of the enemy, took the keys, rose again from the dead, and left the spirit of Christ for me and you. But he had to die and go. Because the devil, the anointed evil one, moved out Elijah's servant so it could not be passed on. And Elijah died with the anointing. And Jesus went to go get it for me and you. Do you understand? And let me tell you, when I saw that man, I about passed out. And then the man that was, the prophet that was there, and I was out in the audience, he called me up. The man, I saw, I, I know what I saw. And it blew me away. And I wept because I realized that he died for me to go get the anointing. He died for you to go get the anointing. Far be it that we should just take it nonchalantly. He gave his life for the anointing, and you must give your life for it. So as you catch the anointing and you receive the message of the anointing, you're allowed to teach the message. You express the message, the mystery, the revelations. As you continue to catch the anointing, the anointing will catch you. <laughs> and I want to close it, First Thessalonians 4. 
in verse 13. The anointing will catch up the church. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have fallen have no hope. In verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with them those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that he who are, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Everyone say caught up. Together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So the anointing will catch us up also. Catching the anointing. Again, don't take it nonchalantly, but catch it. Catching the anointing will bring healing, brings revelation, brings life. 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 His words are life. Why? Because the anointed one came with his doctrine. That's why he warns us, don't receive anybody else's doctrine. If anybody comes to your house with another doctrine, don't receive it. Why? Because it's the wrong anointing. And if you receive it, you've received the wrong anointing. You've opened yourself up to familiar spirits and you will be deceived. And you will have struggles and troubles. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, we thank you. We thank you. And we ask for your forgiveness, Lord, of rejecting the anointing and not catching the anointing in the message. We ask for your forgiveness. Have mercy upon us and let your grace abound, Master. And search us through and remove those things truly that would cause us not only to offend you but reject your anointing. That would cause us, Lord, to want to live for our life and not yours. Sever us from those things, Lord. Bring healing to your people. Strength to your people. Bring revelation and impartation. Bring the wisdom of the mysteries of God to them that they may go from revelation to revelation or from glory to glory. Keeping the restraints on the flesh that they may be victorious and more than conquerors. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.